Hi, welcome to Programming with Mesh. In this session, we will review the structure of React Native project and work with its basic components in the form of an example. In the previous session, we configured the VS Code and learned how to work with it. Now we are ready to start coding. Well, we will open the project folder that we created with React Native CLI in VS Code. Now we review the project structure and its files. The tests folder contains project test files. This test file is created by default with the project. In the future, we can write more advanced tests. In this section, check the correctness of the code. Inside the next folder, the VS Code settings are stored, which is now empty. The next folder is related to native Android code. Actually, the Android app is created in this folder after compilation. We can find Java files related to running the Android app in this section. The reason for these warnings is that VS Code suggests that you install the Java language extension for better editing of the Java file. Because we don't need to edit Java files, we skip them. The next folder is the native iOS code, which like the native Android code is created at compile time. We have nothing to do with native codes in this series, and we only need them to get the output file. The node module folder contains several modules that the React Native project needs to run, and we have installed this folder using npm or yarn. The root of your project must contain a configuration file named bugconfig. Before executing, Buck reads this file to incorporate any customizations it specifies. Buck exploits a number of strategies to reduce build times. ESLintRC.js is a configuration file for a tool named ESLint. ESLint is a tool for identifying and reporting on patterns found in ECMAScript or JavaScript code with the goal of making code more consistent and avoiding bugs. Flow config file is a place to put your specific flow configuration similar to an ESLint RC file for ESLint. New React Native projects come with a pre-configured flow config file out of the box. These two files are not required for the project and only work when you use Git for source control in your project. This is the default setting for formatting code and it's related to ESLint. Watchman config, that's something you can ignore as you see it's empty here. It's a tool used behind the scenes. App.js file, which holds the code that is responsible for rendering what we see on the screen. In this series, a large part of our work will be with this type of file. A few moments later, we return to this file and edit it a bit. App.json holds some configuration for our React Native app, such as name of app. Babel config configures how the JavaScript code is optimized and compiled. We can leave the default here as well. Index.js, which runs at the beginning and imports the initial component into the app with the name of the app. Metro.config includes the default Metro configs that run when the app runs. Package.json file manages your dependencies and holds scripts and main config for you. When you install node modules, the name and version number are saved in this file. And yarn.log, which is an auto-generated file of node modules, never edited. If you created the project with Expo, in this section you will have the Expo folder instead of Android and iOS folders. The important file for us at the moment is the app.js file, because that's in the end responsible for getting something onto the screen. As we learned in the previous session, we run the Android emulator to run the app in it. We will open a new terminal to run the app. With the React Native run Android command, we can run the app. Another way is to use a script. The scripts that we can run with the npm command are in the package.json file. These scripts were created by default when creating the project but you can add any script of your choice to it. Using scripts for long and repetitive commands will help a lot. 
To run a script, just use the script name after the npm run command. As we can see, executing this command actually executes the script associated with it. In the previous session, we ran the metro separately. But as you can see, by running this command, if the metro has not been run before, it will run automatically in a CMD window. Well, the app ran properly. So now we go to the app.js file to find out what parts it has. This part of the code which is in J6 format makes the page look. Using this format you can enter comments between codes and these comments will not be compiled. For example I enter a comment here for testing. As you can see, with every change we make in the code, the app will refresh. This feature is called Fast Refresh, which can be disabled through the developer menu. We will explain it in a few seconds. For manual refresh, we can press the R key on the Metro screen. And to open the developer menu, press the D key. Well, I press the R key once and the app refreshes. Now by pressing the D key, we open the developer menu to explain it. The first option is manual refresh. The second option is debugging the project. In previous videos, I explained how to debug using the Chrome browser. The next option is change bundle location, which we are not currently working on it. The next option opens the inspector, which actually gives us information about each element in the screen. The next option disables the fast refresh. And if we change the code, the app will no longer refresh, and we will have to refresh manually. I will reactivate it. The next option is for profiling, which we don't currently use it. The next option is to monitor the information on the screen. By activating it, we must give the necessary access to the app so that it can display the content. As you can see, screen information such as FPS is displayed in this section. The last option includes settings for debugging and performance. Also, if you are using a real device, you can open the developer menu by shaking the device. At the beginning of the file, we always do the imports. We import React and also the components of React Native that we have used. And then we import other components from other modules. This arrow function, defined as const, returns a block of JS6 code and like HTML code on the web, forms the structure of the page. This type of annotation is only used in TypeScript files. So we can delete this part of the function, so that there is no error in the code. The first component used is status bar, which is considered as a React Native component, and in fact controls the status bar of the device. For example, here it's given a dark style. We can close each block of code with an arrow next to it. The next block is a style sheet. Unlike CSS for HTML, it defines the style of the components. Finally, we export the app function to be displayed as output. Well, in the following, we will review the app function. The next component used is Safe Area View, which forms the body of the page. This component adjusts the screen frame for us intelligently and automatically observes them in fonts that have notches or have such margins. 
The next component is screw view, which makes the content within it screwable. As you can see, it has a style. This style is defined in the style sheet and the background color is specified. View and text components are the most basic components of React Native. The text to be displayed must be between two text tags. For example, here we have the text of step 1. We can see the result by changing it. If I close the views, we will better understand the structure of the page. Here we have four views, each with text tag. View tag works like div tag in HTML and separates sections with custom styles. At the bottom of the page, there are a number of links that do not exist directly here, but are predefined in a component and only imported here. So now let's change the look of this page to our liking. I delete items that don't apply to us. As you can see, when I remove the components from the import and the app refresh, it gives an error that it can't find the component. I delete all the components to create the components we want. We only keep the body in a style sheet to attribute it to the body of page. Here we enter the view tag. Well, normally this code should not have an error. But the error message tells us that it can't find the color component. This component is used in styles, and we remove the component from the import. We can use hex color instead. Well, now the app was refreshed without error. Inside the view tag, we insert a text tag, and we write our desired text between the tags. I enter the name of the channel here. Now we want to attribute the body style to the view tag. Select the styles. It shows us its objects, which now only contain body. Now I change the hex value to specify the view tag on the page. We can see that the view size is the same as the text height and page width by default. Now we want to display the text in the center of the screen with the help of a style. Now select align items and center its value. This allows the contents of the view to be centered horizontally. Now we select the justify content and give it a center value. This puts the content inside the view vertically centered. Well, it happened. But because our view was as high as the text, the text did not come to the center of the page. To solve this problem, we use flex and set its value to 1. We will talk about flex in the future. For now, we just want to play a little with this page to make it clear for us. If I change the color here, you will see that the view is full screen and the text is displayed in the center. Now to make the display text more readable, we will give it a separate style. We name it text and assign it to the text tag to see the result when it changes. Well, first we change its color to white. Then we make it a little bigger by using the font size. We can also change the font style, for example, I make it italic. Now we create a button under the text tag. Select the button tag to be automatically added to the imports at the top of the page. The reason for the error is that it must have a title, so we write a title for it. Clicking on it still does not happen. The distance between the button and the text is short, so we can solve this problem with a style. For example, I give the text tag a margin of 10 to distance itself from the surrounding elements. Well, now we use the onPress method to make something happen by clicking on the button. When you use this method, you must define a function inside it. I want to open my YouTube channel on the device by clicking on this button. We use linking to open URLs. 
select the open URL function and as you can see this function accepts only one string variable. So I enter the URL as the input. Now I want to be directed to my YouTube channel by clicking on the button. As you can see this address was opened in the YouTube app. If the YouTube app was not installed, this address would open in the browser. If I exit the app, you will see that the app is installed on the emulator, but its icon is still the default, which I will explain its personalization in the future. In this series, we will do the tutorials with practice and with source code. I created a repository in GitHub and I will put the source code in each session. To use them, go to this page with the link in the description, and in the branch section, select all branches. Select the desired session number from the list, and from this section, clone or download the codes. So there we go. We got acquainted with the structure of a React Native project and learned how to work with its basic components to some extent. In the next session, we will get acquainted with the estate and learn how to use it in a component. Now, if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to share, subscribe and like, and I'll see you in the next session.